Hi, everybody. Welcome into episode 106 of Hoops Across the Mountain State. I'm your host, Taylor Kennedy. Thank you all for joining me on my 106th episode. We've had a strong start to the summer so far, having guys like Cookie Miller, um, Kevin Jones. We had our transfer portal episode as well. So we've had a strong start. Let's continue that trend. I, and also, if you're watching, I got the man hillbillies on today. I got to support my guy, TJ Blevins, because he's doing a great job down there. So shout out to the man hillbillies. And speaking of Southern West Virginia, we got ourselves a special guest. I'm joined by, if you're watching, and you'll hear it as well, I'm joined by Maurice Mo Robinson, Welch native, went to, went to WVU, played for Jody Gardner, had a lot of great guys that he played with. Maurice, how are you? I have uh, one question for you, though. Okay. Why, why did it take you 106 episodes to get to me? That's a great question, and that is my fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll, take, I'll take the full blame for that one. I'm only kidding. Hey, uh, it's better to get you on now than later. I agree. I love I'm it. Ready. How I are agree. you, my man? I'm doing well. Doing well. Retired uh, recently. Uh, still living in Morgantown. Enjoying uh, my retirement as much as I can. Uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has had me a little held back as far as uh, things that I want to get done uh, in retirement, but hopefully that'll be over soon and I can resume having some uh, free time to do what I want to do and go where I want to go. Absolutely. I think that I'm the same way. I'm the same way. I think everybody's that way. Yeah. So for people that may not know, what after you finished your career at WVU, what was next for you in your life? What did you do? What did you retire from? Just walk us through that. Well, I got my degree from WVU in 78 uh, and I uh, – Got it in business management. At the time, I, I thought that that was a, a appealing field where I could make a decent amount of money. Uh, only found out later that I wasn't able to make as much as I wanted to. Uh, but I, I had a lot of good experiences in that field and, and getting to, to know people and become friends with a lot of people and, and, and things like that. So that's what I gained from going in that direction. But right after graduation uh, in 78, I, um, I got married in uh, 1980. So I've been married 42 years. Uh, have uh, three kids. I lost uh, my oldest son in uh, July of 2016. He had sickle cell disease. Um, I have a daughter that's 39 and I have a younger son that's uh, 34 years old. I have a grand new grandbaby, uh, eight months old now, and I have two grandkids uh, that live down in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that are ten and thirteen, so that's what that's that's in a nutshell right there. What I've been doing. Do you ever stop every once in a while and you're just like, "Wow, it's it's been that long since I left WVU." Have you have you felt that before? I mean, what's what was that moment like when you're just sitting back and you're just saying, "Man, I've been away for a while." You know what? I I worked out of side of Morgantown for for a few years. Um, but I've been back in, in Morgantown uh, area since uh, for 30 years because I worked for CVS Pharmacy for 30 years. But I always maintained my family here. I worked on the road, but my family was all, all raised here, and we all lived here. They all lived here. Uh, I'd come home on the weekends. and So I really haven't been away. And I guess I can tell you how I know that because, you know, every day I, I walk out, and I, I'm telling you, it never fails. People in town um, – they recognize you, you know, and I always ask you how you're doing, where you been, because I worked in the retail industry, you know, you, you deal with a lot of customers and they get to know you. So people, ne they don't forget. So it, had, it doesn't feel that long, like I've been away a really long time. Just feel like I've gotten a lot older. You know, I don't know if that sounds crazy, but I haven't been gone long, but I've gotten a lot older. So, you know, because I talk to people now that they say, oh, well, we saw you play. Uh, my dad used to bring you to the games when I was – 13, 14, you know, and I remember watching you play, and, and my gosh, you know, now I'm 60, 65, and, uh, you know, that kind of makes you feel old. You know, young kids come and tell you, they, and they're, they're 50, 60 years old now, so, <laughs> you know, but uh, it, it's all good being here in Morgantown. A lot of places, a lot worse places I could be. That's a good point. That's a good point as well. But, okay, so let me ask you this then. From your time when you first got to Morgantown in college to today, what do you? What's the biggest difference that you've seen in the town of Morgantown? The town of Morgantown has grown tremendously. Uh, <laughs> when I got here, they had they, they had the PRT, but there wasn't a lot of the the, the road systems throughout the, 
the town are the same, but the area around everywhere is just grown so much that it's it's just unbelievable. Uh, when I first came to school here, there's probably fifteen, sixteen thousand kids. I don't know how many they they uh, they have now, but it's a lot bigger than what it was when I came here. So you're telling me that, that the PRT was still around. Now, did it have the same issues that students are still um, encountering with today? Did it always break down? It always broke down, but it, at the time, it was one of the most innovative things that could be found in the United States. I mean, it was just, you know, that's what, you know, if you talked about Morgantown, you talked about the PRT. You talked about University uh University of West Virginia talked about the PRT. That was the calling card for Morgantown and West Virginia University all over the country, the PRT. Now, were you just one of those people where, like, if you had to escape from everything, you just got on the PRT, just, it just took you wherever you wanted to go? Well, it didn't, it wasn't, it didn't go all over campus at that time. It just came downtown and uh, out to the uh, uh, Towers engineer, engineering building, oh, okay. and uh, that was it. It didn't go out to the med center. Uh, it wasn't as uh, <laughs> it didn't go everywhere like it does now, but it's it was always convenient to get back and forth to class that way. Okay, let me ask you this then: Have you ever been stuck on the PRT? Never been stuck on a PRT. Really? Never. It's the worst. I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. Wouldn't want to be stuck on a PRT. Oh, absolutely not. Especially whenever it's eight o'clock in the morning, you got an eight thirty class. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be so worried about the class, but <laughs> that being stuck there would just freak me out. Yeah, that's a good point. That's There's a good not point. a lot of a lot of room in that thing. Not a lot of room at all. Yeah, it's almost to the point where you can just stretch your arms out like hey, this and just touch both touch sides. Touch both sides of the thing. You sure could. Oh my goodness. Well, Maurice, just to give the audience a little bit of a perspective of what we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about growing up in Welch, playing down there in that in that portion of West Virginia as well. Talk, go, coming to WVU, and we'll just also just talk about just what life was back then for you. Obviously, I've said this before. Basketball in West Virginia was a golden uh, era. It was booming at that point. You got a lot of great teams. So let's start there. And look back at your childhood, if you would. When you look back at when you first picked up a basketball, and just from there, just the rest is history, when did basketball start becoming serious for you? Well, growing up at Welch, you know, and I want to premise this by saying I, I, I am so thankful, and I always say that and say this to to anybody I'm talking to or people I'm speaking to, I am so proud and honored to, to have been raised and grown up in McDowell County in Welch in the time that I was grew up. It was, uh, it was a booming place. I mean, you, you wouldn't imagine it now with the way it is now, but at the time, you know, Welch was, a, was a, the county seat of McDowell County. McDowell County, we had five different high schools, uh, with probably in a radius of, 30 miles of each other, tremendous rivalries, uh, tremendous talent, talent laden area in the in the state of West Virginia at the time. Um, the coal coal mines were were, were booming uh, in Welch. It, it probably had in McDowell County probably 10, 15,000 uh, residents, but we had three hospitals in Welch. Uh, we had a bus system, train system. I mean, growing up. Uh, we had organized sports. I played football, basketball, baseball. Uh, in high school, I ran track. I mean, everything that you would think would be a non-thought at that time, and and, and at that time w was existent. I mean, we just had all opportunities to do all the things that we wanted to do as kids. Um, we had five high schools. Uh, Welch was the only Triple A school, but. There, but uh, we had North Fort Gary, Yeager, Big Creek also. And uh, I'm telling you, the, the, the rivalries were just tremendous. Um, basketball really came, you know, we played all the sports as kids. That's all we did was play sports. There were no video games or anything, any stuff like that that would keep you inside. You know, most of us at that time didn't even have TVs or, or families didn't have automobiles. Not because they didn't have the money to have them, but – it just it just wasn't a thing that had to be in every household, in every room, or in every garage or whatever. So we spent a lot of time playing, playing. I mean, and and today, you know, you look outside, you go by the playgrounds or whatever, drive around, you don't see any kids out. You know, you don't see them out playing. They're all, well, I don't know where they all are, but I know most of them are in their rooms uh, playing on uh, 
whatever you call these uh, video games now. And there's so many of them, so many different names. But we didn't have that. And I think that at that time, if we had it, we still wouldn't. We'd rather be outside. So, you know, that's, that's what we did. Uh, basketball really didn't uh, come real uh, as a real goal of mine and probably until uh, – my ninth grade year because I played, like I said, I played all other sports up until that time. And ninth grade, uh, you know, we were getting ready to start our football season, you know, for the ninth graders, and they had us out in the with the the uh, upperclassmen, you know, after the junior high season was over. And uh, the coach that time, Frank Marino, was um, he coached the football team too, so he just told me that. Uh, we don't, we don't want you playing any more football. You're going to play basketball. So that's when I started, I guess, uh, concentrating on basketball. And uh, that's, that's when it all started. Uh, I played high school as a freshman. I played four years of high school basketball. And, um, you know, we, we always had good teams, but the competition was so tough. And, uh, and uh, you know, we always had winning seasons, good records, but uh, – Competition was just so great in that time. Time and when you divide it up between single A, double A, triple A, we were a triple A team, but our, our uh, we were probably the smallest triple A school in the state. So you know we were a lot of uh, we were outmatched talent wise. And once we got to the sectionals and regionals and the state tournament, but you know we always did really well. So going back to one of my previous episodes that I had with was with North Fork alum Russell Todd, as we've discussed before off the air. And Russell had said that whenever he, whenever he was growing up, he would have four or five guys maybe, and they would just go to different mm-hmm. parks, basketball courts, and just, just run just run the courts. Just That's run right. it. That's what did, you did. Ever, did you ever run in the Russell whenever you guys were playing outside? No, well, Russell was a lot younger than I was. Uh, I graduated in 74. I'm sure Russell was uh, – Russell didn't come to WU until I had been out of school – Oh, that's right. Yep. Uh, maybe a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I played against his brother, his 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 brothers, uh, when I was at school. So, they never came to Welch and played to, because, like I said, nobody had cars or anything. So, you know, they would if if chances were, you know, we would play Gary, which Gary was only six miles away, uh, but we didn't travel over the mountains and and try to seek out talent and games because there was enough right there where we lived. And uh, it could get pretty competitive. I can remember uh, growing up at, you know, when we got out of school, the, the kids got out of school, we got out of school 2, 3 o'clock, and we would go rush right to, rush straight to the playground and get our games in because later that evening the older guys would come in and we wouldn't get a game in. But uh, by the end of my freshman year, you know, I was able to play with those guys and, uh, you know, and they taught me a lot of stuff there on the playground. We'll get to that here in just a second, but go back to, you know, rushing to the playground. Did you did you guys make the teams during math class, or did you guys do a draft like what they like when you're on when you're on the playground? You're just like, okay, I'll take Maurice. You guys get him. I'll get him. What was that like? Did you already have your set five? <laughs> you would have. You, you know, we'd all go down to the playground and we just choose teams. Uh, you know, we we picked the captain of this team, the captain of that team. He would choose who he he. You know, he picked five guys that he wanted on his team. And the guys that lost, you had another guy that was coming up that had next game. He would choose five, he would choose four others to play with him. The winner stayed up. Uh, after he won three games, you know, you had to give it up and, and let somebody else play. But that's how we did it. I mean, it wasn't five guys that played together all the time. We all just played and fought together. So you, you had just mentioned about – eventually being able to play with the older guys on the playground. What was that like for you? Well, it didn't happen. It, it didn't happen instantly. You know, I was told to sit there for a long time and, you know, I kept growing and growing and I finally, you know, I was about six, six and uh, skinny as a rail, but you know, they would allow me to play because I did have some talent and I was tall. So that's how, that's how all that got started. And uh, that's, that's when I really started to, to take a look at basketball is something that I could use to get uh, get an education, uh, get a job or, or whatever, you know, to get out of Welch. But it wasn't, it wouldn't, just to get out of Welch and get a job. 
You had also mentioned how they taught you a lot of things whenever you would play with them. Talk about that. What were some of the things that they did teach you, whether it be on the court or off the court? Well, <laughs> you, t- you, you learn. The, the thing that I learned, I, I think, that I, I took more from than any specific skill or anything was the physicality of the, of the game. Uh, and even being a, a, a young kid and, and weighing only 100, 180 pounds at the time, it ha- you had to be physical. You know, the court was small. Uh, you had to hold your own. And uh, that's the biggest thing that I think I took. Other than before the point where I start learning all the other fundamentals of uh, just the little intricacies of the game. But, uh, yeah, you had, to, you had to be tough. You had to be strong. And uh, – you had to be tough. You had to be really tough. Okay, so then you, you play in the playground. You learn a lot of these valuable lessons, and then you get to the high school side of things for you. You mentioned a lot. You mentioned how McDowell County had five high schools, including you all. You guys were a tri- the only AAA school, and you had teams like North Fork as well. You had mentioned before we started that you guys played in holiday tournaments with those five schools, including you all. What was that like? I assume that was that would have been a, those games would have been high intense. They were highly intense. Uh, you know, Norfolk won every uh, <laughs> every ice. Well, no, maybe not all of them, but they won ninety percent of them. Shocker. The, so, yeah, the, the, <laughs> they were most of the holiday terms that we had. But you know, we'd have good crowds, and you know, they gave us a little trophy for all tournament team. But uh, I only during my four years of high school. Uh, including the holiday tournament. We played Norfolk two or three times a year. Only won one game against them. Uh, that was the, the last to, in my senior year, the second game against them that season. Uh, so <laughs> I did get out of words for beating uh, Norfolk. But I, but trust me, there was a lot of teams that didn't, didn't beat them at all. And uh, I was proud to get that one win on my last, last chance to get that. So you, again – Southern West Virginia during that time period had a lot of great teams. You, we've mentioned Welch. We've mentioned North Fork. Oceana was down in that region as well. Talk about those games against North Fork and Oceana. And let's go. We'll start with Oceana because I've heard a lot of I've heard a lot about them recently. When you look at those matchups between Welch and Oceana, what are your, some of your what are your what are some of your fondest memories of playing them? I can remember traveling to, to Oceana playing, and and you know at that time it it was it was just different going there, and because Oceana was predominantly was all white, and uh, come from McDowell County, you know we were practically all all black, and I can remember being on the court and and uh, some of the kids, and that, it never was to the point where. You know, you think you would, would want to fight somebody or, or or have an altercation in that manner, but you know they would always say things like, "Man, I bet your mother is black. You're black." You know, things like that just to get you off your game. But after you know, every, it was like that all the time. Now they came to Welch, of course. We but they were, you know our fans would would try to pay them back, but it wasn't nearly as intimidating as us a bus a bus full of uh, black kids, uh, mostly black kids, traveling to Oceana and seeing the little black. People in the yards and on the uh, the statues and and all that kind of stuff. But to come, I came to learn later in my life that those um, little black people that were standing in the yards they had a significant meaning, and it wasn't it wasn't a disrespectful type of thing, but it was just a a cultural thing that they had gotten from their parents or something. But it wasn't really uh, aimed to intimidate anybody. But I didn't learn that till late. You know, as a young kid, you could see that see how that would be very intimidating. And um, but they always treated us nice. Uh, football player from Oceana, Ron Miller, came to school here, and we became really good friends. Uh, he played, uh, he, I think he played tight end here or something. But we we became uh, real good friends here after we graduated from high school. But that w- that was a thing with uh, go- going to Oceana. But Oceana, uh, I got the most points of my career against Oceana uh, in a game, and that was fifty two points. But um, you try to compare going to Oceana and going to Norfolk uh, and playing in that gym was like a cracker box, and you know it was packed, and and uh, the the the, uh, the fans set up above the floor, and uh, you're talking about intimidation, and uh, 
and, and they were very, very talented every year, year in and year out. Uh, so there were just two, two totally different ends of uh, competition when you talk about playing Norfolk against playing uh, Oceana. We thought we had a chance against Oceana, but Norfolk was never something that we could uh, we could get get past. So I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a side road real quick. I want to ask you this question. So those two schools have both now been closed down, and they've mm-hmm. been, they've either consolidated or they've just shut down in general. And that seems to be a very popular trend across West Virginia. Either either schools consolidated teams like we just mentioned Oceana and Northfork. We have Charleston and Kanawha County. Just a, a lot of different schools like that. But when you look back at that time compared to now, is there something missing with that? Because you have a lot of these schools that has a lot of heritage and a lot of tradition, but then when they close down, it just seems like everybody just forgets about them. Talk about that a little bit. That whole thing is, is, is bad, you know, because it, I tell you what, what affected uh, McDowell County and, and Welch and Gary, the five schools in that area, was the coal mines. You know, at the time that I went to school, the coal mines were just booming. You know, everybody had a had a lot of money. The uh, National Bank in McDowell County, the National Bank was, the, believe it or not, the richest bank in the United States at that time. It, it, you know, that's how much money the county and the coal mines generated in that area. You know, everybody had a, well, the people that wanted it, cars had great big cars. You know, the gas was leaded gasoline, and you know, and uh, there was just so much money there. If they if they had a decided to consolidate it, Welch, Gary, and Norfolk at that time, there would have been nobody in the country that could beat us. I mean, they were, they would just I would put us against up against any team, any major city around the country because it was just that much talent in the area. But now you know they consolidate those schools and and uh, the coal mines have gone down and everybody's moved. We know we had a discussion before this. This interview that the census, the the, the latest census had two hundred and some people in uh, McDowell County. Unbelievable, yeah, unbelievable. Well, for Welch, for Welch. Well, Welch, that, that's unbelievable. So we, we, let's continue talking about this, about the trend, or not even the trend, but this, the group of people that were so talented players, I should say, the players that were so talented. We keep talking about these teams. But a wave. We'll step aside from North Fork and Oceana. Give me a couple. Give the audience a couple of names that whenever they hear that name, they're like, "Oh yeah, I remember him. He was a ball player." Ooh, in uh, who in McDowell County? Oh my gosh, there's so many names. Um, where should I start? Uh, let's start at Big Creek. Dad Oscar Patrick, John Braggins, Bob Gresham, um, Gary, uh, the Hamilton brothers. There's three brothers. There's Three brothers that played uh, from that school down through the years, just great players. Norfolk, John Billups, uh, Mark Page, Russell Todd, Doug Riley. Um, had a offensive lineman, uh, came, um, Tom Beasley, played at Virginia Tech, played football. Uh, Bluefield, Dino Martin, Tommy Pritchard. I mean, the list is, is so many that I can't, I'm, I'm having a problem remembering a lot of them. But at Welch High School, Bo Isabel, Billy Walden, uh, Dave Ramella, uh, just all outstanding ball players, not only basketball, but just athletes, football, baseball, whatever. Uh, the list could go on and on, and I don't know him. It's a Dave Allura from Jaeger. Uh, ooh, man, there's just a lot, a lot of athletes that came from McDot County. I, says, I should have been prepared with more names, but – that's just a few off the top of my head right now. So I think that should lead me into my next question, and that is when you look at basketball outside of McDowell County, let's go statewide, basketball in West Virginia during the time period that you were in high school, what made it so popular and just so different than a lot of these other sports within the state of West Virginia? What made it so popular? I think the basketball was just a, just a competitive the, – the nature of the sport and, and the – the, the areas that all the good basketball players came from, and most of them came from f- southern part of the state, from Charleston down, uh, it's just the um, – it just wasn't – I can't speak for, for Charleston or Beckley. I, I can speak for the southern part of the state. There was, just wasn't a lot of other things to do. And, and, and basketball was, was the, 
competition was there. It's highly competitive, and uh, that's just what we did. I don't, I don't know what else to say. That's that's what we did, and uh, and having most of the the, you know, I'm not trying to say that the, all the best basketball players were black, but the the black population in West Virginia at that time was was in McDowell County, you know, it probably had 90% of the black people that lived in West Virginia. Charleston had some, Willing had a few, but the majority of all the black athletes were basketball players, were from McDowell County. And uh, it, as the years went on, you know, um, it stayed that way for a long time. Norfolk won, what, eight state championships, national record. Uh, the one they didn't win, made a nine or ten, was Gary won it. They were from Dallas County, uh, and then it started to, to move a little bit northern. And now, you know, since nobody's left in McDowell County or the southern part of West Virginia, it's it's uh, the better teams are coming from the north now. So it's totally totally turned around. Other than the, other than technology, obviously the technology side of things has given kids or given young players a different outlet of doing things like because like you just said you guys you guys seem like you guys had nothing else better to do so you guys went and got better at basketball but now it seems like you see a lot of kids just staying indoors playing video games not going out as often like what you all did i mean believe me as i told you before and as, and as i've said on this program anytime that we i go uh i'm with my dad and we go by a park and he always says i guarantee you if i were if if i was a, if i was your age right now that court would be full and i'm just like I believe it. I believe it now. That's a natural, so, that's a fact. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever you look at from growing up to now, obviously you've been able to see both the booming side of things and then the, the technology side of things as well. Why do you think there's been a shift with that in a state like West Virginia? Well, West Virginia is historic, historically on the low end of, of, of everything, and I think the, that fact in itself has, has, has transplanted everything to follow suit. Um, and when, when I was growing up, it, it wasn't, we, we weren't on the low end of, of anything. You know, I was thinking about this earlier when, you know, when I was being recruited for West Virginia, I, I, I had an opportunity, you know, when they go to the, um, I went to spend some time with the governor and went to lunch with the governor on one occasion, dinner with the governor at the, at the Capitol building. Uh, and, um, you know, they always had a bunch of steaks, you know, and, I don't know if he thought I, I, I enjoyed steaks, but steaks wasn't a part of our, uh, you know, we just didn't eat steaks. Not because we couldn't afford steaks, but our menu was totally different than eat steaks. But I'd go there and I'd eat four or five steaks, and I was able to take people with me and go. But it, it's that's just, you know, that, that was something totally different. But uh, we... In West Virginia, we are limited in a lot of ways, in the in the, in the areas that uh, the things that we could have done back then, but we didn't let it stop us from getting it done. Now today, it might be a little different, where we're limited in a lot of things that because the whole spectrum has got a lot broader. So there's a lot of different things that people want to do and and aren't able to do because of the economy and the, and the factors that they had in, the, in their decisions. But I think the desire of the kids have, has really changed. Uh, and, you know, this, this opioid crisis in West Virginia is, has taken into effect because there's just not a lot of things that people are taking advantage of job-wise or it's just easier to stay at home and, and not go to work because, you know, you're going to get taken care of, you're going to get food stamps, you're going to get assistance. And, and the people have come to the point where they, that's that's okay, you know. Not that it's bad, but it's just okay, you know. I can I can do that because the cost of living is is a lot lower than it is in other places, which it is. But the, the desire to excel and and put in the work and pay the price to get things is just change. It's just it's just change, and it's nobody's fault in particular. It's just the way things are these days. I mean. It's, it's, it's a lot harder and a lot less desire. So those two involved, combined, it's just, it's just easy to just, just say, lay back and, uh, and do nothing. That's yeah. what a lot of people are doing. No, I, I, I see that. I think a lot of people can speak on that as well just because they may see it as well. 
So I do understand where you're coming from with that. So let's get back to the high school side of things for you. And let's talk recruiting, okay? Looking through who was interested in you. Obviously, you were, you were one of the more sought-after players in West Virginia. And even in, uh, on the East Coast, you scored 1,700 points in high school. Talk about recruiting for you and before we talk about WVU. What was recruiting like for you back then? Well, back in the day, recruiting, and it was totally different than it is now. You could, you, could, you could visit as many schools as you wanted to. Uh, there wasn't a limit on how many you could go to see and visit, and, and I visited everywhere. Uh, everywhere that, you know, being a kid from McDowell County, never been anywhere. Uh, you know, there's a lot of places that uh, I, I wanted to go and wanted to see and have an opportunity to spend some time. And I took total advantage of that. Uh, my senior year, I was gone probably every every weekend, visiting somewhere uh, across the country. Uh, my senior year, Lefty Giselle was supposed to speak. You know, he did speak at our old sports banquet, which I had committed to them on a personal basis, but I was supposed to sign my, uh, my letter that night. Well, we had the banquet. I uh, was supposed to sign a letter that night. I went to him. I said, Coach, I'm going to sign. I want, I want to take one more trip, and I want to go to, to Hawaii. He said, okay, well, go ahead. You know, that's okay. Go to Hawaii, and we'll talk to you when you get back. Well, I went to Hawaii, got back. They had given my scholarship to somebody else, which was, you know, it was okay. It was okay because I can understand that because a program of that size with that nature, and uh, I can understand them doing that. Because you know, when I grew up, it wasn't a West Virginia thing because we never saw West Virginia play. You know, I didn't listen to them on the radio. None of their games were ever televised. All we saw was ACC basketball, ACC football. Everything we sports that we watched on TV was ACC. And uh, you know, naturally, I wanted to go to ACC. So I went to um, after Merlin. Uh, they turned me down. I uh, decided I want to go to Wake Forest. And uh, and the day that I signed, I was supposed to sign to go to Wake Forest. Carl, Carl Tacey was the coach there, and he, he was uh, college, so he had a little pain. And he uh, flew up to, uh, to Welch. We had a little airport there and to sign me. But in between him getting to the school uh, to – for me to go through the signing, the people in Welch decided that they want to have a meeting, you know, concerning West Virginia. And uh, they uh, convinced me to to come to West Virginia. By that time, I was so beat up and, and tired of the whole re recruiting process that I agreed. Uh, and I signed the coach from West Virginia, got there right before Cartesi did, and I signed, uh, signed with them. So it was just like a real freaky thing. Uh, that day, but that that decision, even though at the time it wasn't a committed decision or a decision that I had thought a lot about, it was the best decision I could make uh, to come to school here, and I don't regret that for one minute. We went back after that to uh, doing my I don't know, we paid way for some uh, every year, but we went down there and uh, man, they gave me all kind of hell. I mean, geez, it was. Uh, it was crazy. You know, they had banners and posters and people dressed up in uh, coveralls. and It was just crazy. <laughs> crazy. One of the worst games I ever had. But they didn't forget that I had done that. And uh, they, they got after me pretty good. We lost the game. I had a terrible game. Uh, didn't care to go back there anymore. <laughs> crazy. So I want to make sure I get this correct. So you're telling me that you were about to sign with Wake Forest and, his, and their head coach was on his way up, or at least he was about to leave, and then the people of Welch said, let's have a meeting. Let's have a meeting. And let's send Maurice to WVU. So, yes. you're, so you're saying from the time that he probably <laughs> left his house, because obviously technology was a lot different. He had to probably get on a, on a pay phone or he had, to, uh, um, yeah. he had to go to one of those. So you're saying from the time that he left to the time he got there, they had a meeting, and in between that meeting they said, Maurice – I think you should go to WVU. Exactly. That's the way – that's a crazy story, but that's exactly the way it went down. And they talked me into going 
to, to West Virginia. So what, so what did they say that convinced you? It wasn't about, you know, I, I know I tell that story and people say, well, they get offer you a lot of money or this or that. That's not the way it was at all. It just it was uh, the, the, the feeling that they had about West Virginia and the, the pride that they had in West Virginia um, just came out in them at that point in time. I saw it, and uh, I, I guess it got my attention because, because it did get my attention. And um, I just decided that I, I, my mom was waiting for me to get home from, uh, from signing work for us, and I called her up on the phone. I said, Mom, I signed with uh, West Virginia. She said, oh, I'm glad you did. And uh, that was all of, the, uh, all of the definition I needed. That's the only clarity that I need, that I had maybe right, I had made the right choice. But she was about tired of it, too. She was tired of all the recruiting. I had to get my own telephone when I was in high school, and I stayed on the phone all the time. These guys calling you all the time. And it, it really got hard, hard to uh, – after I'd done, gone everywhere I wanted to go and seen all the things I thought I needed to see, uh, it got to be really taxing. Uh, and I wanted more than anything to get the whole process over with. That being involved, being being alongside uh, you know the people in Welch uh, coming out and uh, supporting me the way that they did, uh, I just changed my mind. So you would also said that you were very interested in Hawaii. I went to Hawaii. Now did you? Now did they teach you how to hula hula down? No, there? no, no, I didn't. I, I just <laughs> ate good and and uh, spent some time in the ocean and saw that beautiful country as much as I could. And uh, I. I you know, it's just strange how, you know, at that time, these schools could uh, send a kid from West Virginia to Hawaii to come and visit. Cause, I mean, the chances of that occurring is very, very, very slim. Even back then, it was probably a lot slimmer then than it is now. But they uh, they recruited me, and they, they wanted me to come out and see what they had to offer. And they did that, and, and I did that. So that's how that ended. Okay, so... According to the notes I'm reading, you were Coach Jody Gardner's first recruit at WVU. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, Jody, uh, the coaches at West Virginia had come down to, to visit me. And uh, it was Sonny Moran and um, Coach McPherson had come down to uh, to visit me. And on the way down, they had a, they had a terrible accident, a uh, car accident. And on the way back, they learned that they had been – been fired, <laughs> and, jo and Jody had become the coach. Uh, and uh, Jody, being been you know a brand new coach, he wanted to sign, I guess, the best player in West Virginia. And uh, they came after me off awfully hard, and, and that's when I had the dinners with the uh, with the uh, governor, because I never they never really recruited me before that West Virginia, and then, then the, that visit. The coaches were on the way down to Welch and had a car accident. And on the way after getting their car fixed and driving back to uh, Morgantown, they got fired. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a lot of crazy things that, that happened through that whole process. But I think it was – I never thought that I made a mistake about coming here uh, to, to play basketball. Uh, now, on the other hand, I wish that I had um, – looked at the coaching, uh, got more information on the, the, the type of coaches, a coach that I was uh, going to be playing for because it was it was uh, very taxing the way that uh, Jody had on our team. Um, we had, um, we never lacked talent, never. I mean, we had guys, I mean, I played with, Oh, I played with guys, the NBA players. I played with All Americans. I played with Hall of Famers. Uh, there was always abundance of them on, on any team that I played on in West Virginia. But for some reason, uh, we couldn't put together a winning tradition the way that we all wanted it to be because of different reasons. You know, I hate to, I don't want to get into all that, but it, it we just <laughs> the the um, the locker room was a great place to be, but 
on the court and on the bench during games. Uh, it was just uh, uh accident waiting to happen. Uh, that's the best description I can give of it. But, um, you know, as far as coming to West Virginia, I, n- I never thought that I made a mistake in doing that. So your junior year in the 75-76 season, you played with head coach Bob Huggins, yes. who's, who's, still, who's still around. And then you played with Warren Baker, friend of this program as well. You guys were both listed as 6-7 on the roster. What was that like on that team being – let me ask you like this then. How were you all able to balance having a guy like Hugs, Baker, and you all together? How were you guys able to balance it and be so effective throughout the season? We we did because we, we really I, – I spoke about the locker room because we were good good teammates, good friends, and had a great knowledge of, of basketball. Um along with the talent that we possess. And it was always a battle. I mean, I'll give you an example. Coach Gardner had said at one point that Bacon and I couldn't play together because we were the same size, had similar skills or whatever. But at some point in, during the season, he, he decided that he was going to bench me and then not start me, and then he was going to start Bacon, not start me. But he would very seldom had us on the floor at the same time. Now, I'll tell you, Bacon and I, um, we weren't going to get our rebound. I mean, this uh, our talents, I mean, were similar, but they weren't they, – they were different in a lot of ways. Uh, we did a lot of the same things, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we didn't lack any knowledge or, or talent as far as that goes. But he, for some reason, he wouldn't play us together, so we had to get through that. <laughs> he never broke that up, never, never, never recovered from that. Bake never uh, – Never uh, recovered from that. I mean, it, it was it was my sophomore year because back then play was uh, junior, junior year. It was Hugs and I and Tony Robertson and uh, Russell Chapman, Sid Bossick, Lowe's was on that team. But Bag was uh, two years ahead of us, so he wasn't on that 75-76 uh, team. Yes, he was the only team. Okay, it was 76, 77, 77, 78. Okay, he was the only But on that team, that we kind of went through that the whole season. So um, – but he had a problem uh, getting the, the 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 best results from all of us because we Hugs was a coach at a very young age. You know, he didn't. You could tell the coach yeah, Hugs. Had you that you knew that, yeah. yeah. But you know, he was he was kind of guy that uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't say much. You know, uh, and I on the other time on the other hand would uh, totally different. I was not that I was cocky or run my mouth or talk back or anything like that. I was just if I had something to say, I would say it, and uh, that didn't go over too well. But um, you know, it, it, Coach Garner was uh, was an ex-Marine, so that in itself uh, can maybe you can get an idea of uh, his mentality. Uh, my um, Junior year, we had uh, I had had a four foot sprain on my uh, my right foot. That uh, I don't know if you ever had a four foot sprain. It's different different than an ankle sprain because you can't hardly put any any weight on your foot. Uh, but we had played, um, and this is a story I never told. We had played Duquesne the night before, and uh, I, had, I had gone through the four foot sprain, but I played anyway. We won the game. After the game, uh, Jody comes up and says, uh, well, if it had been up to the trainers, you wouldn't have played tonight. Well, I was I was going to play anyway because I had no intentions of, of setting out. I said, oh, okay. Well, I hope you know I was going to play anyway. But um, that night we drove back from Pittsburgh and it started snoring. The next day, we weren't supposed to have the day off. That night, it snored like six feet in Morgantown. And hit six feet. Biggest snore in 1978. Uh, it was just my senior. 19, biggest snowstorm that had ever happened in Morgantown. Well, that morning, Jordy calls and uh, wants to practice. Well, nothing. The buses aren't running. Nobody can get their cars dug out. Um, I mean, it just was. The only way to get to practice was for us to walk through six feet of snow. So I called him up and I said, well, Coach, can you can you make arrangements? Can you have somebody pick us up or 
you know, if anybody, you're there at the Coliseum, does anybody can drive over here, the manager or somebody come and pick us up and take us to practice? No problem practicing. Of course, because I was injured, I wasn't going to practice anyway. So he said, no, get there the best way you can. So I told the guys, I said, well, let's just not go to practice. Because that's, let's not go to practice. But they voted against me. They, they started walking to practice, and they made it to practice. Well, I sit there, and I, I, I pondered about going to practice because I know it's going to hurt like hell. And, but I, I, I walked to practice from Towers to the Coliseum, got dressed for practice, was on a, on a training table getting ready to get my ankles taped, and the horn blew for practice to start. So I finished getting my ankles taped, tape, got up, and he walks over to me and says, uh, you're a minute late. And I said, yeah, I had to walk because I had a painful walk. Well, he said, go upstairs and start running. So I said, I don't, Coach, I, I can't run. You know I can't run. Why would you even ask me to do that? You know I can't run. I just walked to Towers. And I said, I'm not, I'm not running. So he told me to leave. So that I got kicked off the team for that. And um, we, we, our next game was at uh, Notre Dame. Uh, was a game that I did not want to miss because the previous year I had like 21 points, 15 right, rebounds. We beat Notre Dame at the Coliseum, beat them pretty bad. Um, so didn't want to miss that game. So, but it was still snowing all through the country and. But they did get a flight to Notre Dame. I think the, the, they played the game, lost the game, and the next game was supposed to be at Cincinnati where I was supposed to fly from Morgantown to Cincinnati, but all the flights got canceled. So I, I, we they canceled that game altogether. So, yeah, so I missed two of the biggest games of my senior year uh, because of that little incident. Now, at the same time, Lowe's was – had, had done the same thing, and he was late for practice, and Jody told him to run, and, and Lowe's went upstairs and ran. But at the time, I didn't know Lowe's had done that, had gone up there and ran. If, if I had known that at the time, I probably would have gone up there and joined him uh, or tried to join him or something. I don't know. But I didn't know that at the time, and I, so I wasn't, I wasn't going to uh, run. So that's a story that I've never told before. Nobody know that story, man. And I got kicked off the team, and – and all the newspapers and television, uh, people were calling me at my, and uh, I, I had some good people around me, which uh, gave me good advice. Uh, and I, I just moved out of my dorm room and moved in with a friend of mine and didn't accept any calls. And finally, the, the person that got in touch with me was Hugs, because <laughs> I wasn't talking to anybody else. You know, I talked to Hugs and we talked about it. And, well, you got to come talk, and so I went in, and we talked, and after that, everything was okay <laughs> again. But, you know, again, I had missed the, the two best, the two games in my senior year that I did not and could not afford to lose, uh, not not playing uh, as far as, uh, you know, getting drafted and, and, and that type of thing. Those were the two games that I, I didn't want to miss. But you got that out of me, so now what, what next? It's a long story. That's a hard, hard story to talk about. And well, if, yeah, well, I appreciate you saying. It is. I appreciate it you is. sharing. It is, but that's the kind of mentality that 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 we had to deal with on a regular basis. Now, our assistant coaches, wonderful guys, wonderful, knew how to communicate, to motivate. Uh, but 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 Jody was a boss, and uh, you know I I, I uh, over the years. Uh, We've spoken about that incident, and he uh, says he doesn't remember it, but, but I know he remembers it. But, you know, I've come to terms with it, and uh, I still I still speak with him uh, on occasion. And my other coach, Coach Amy, just passed away uh, this year. Uh, heart and soul of the team, of the coaching staff, as far as the team was concerned, uh, great guy, Coach Reshai. Uh, Former W player, great guy, but just uh, just uh, the impact that that Jody had on the team was just too much to to overcome. I can just remember incidences in the in the in the locker room that you know he would have guys crying. Uh, uh, oh man, I could tell you stories about about Jody that you know nobody 
at least you know. But it was just, you know, not make excuses for myself. I'm still proud of the career that I had. I think I had a good career, uh, productive career, but it could have been a, a lot, lot better. Uh, and I don't know how Bank explained his experience here, but if it's not something similar to that, then he's holding a lot back. I just say that, you know, but that's that. So I'm gonna say about that. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with me. You yeah. do. That's a that's the first time I ever told that that story. First time I ever told that story. Wow, that's a, that's unbelievable. A couple more questions for you, and I, again, I appreciate you joining me. So, looking at your time at WVU, you were, you are, a West Virginia native. You were able to play at the state's university. What did that mean for you, being a West Virginia native and being able to represent? your home state playing at WVU. That's, that's what makes it important for me to say that I, I know that I didn't make a, mis, a mistake by coming to school here because the, 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 the relationship that, that the state of West Virginia, the people of West Virginia, the, the town of Morgantown, the fans of the Coliseum that, that, that we have has been an everlasting one. I mean, it doesn't change. Like I told you before, you know, people today – you know, that's that's 45 years ago when I finished playing ball and people still recognize me and, uh, you know, they, they hear my name and, you know, you hear them whispering and and they they remember you. I don't know that that happens if I go to Wake Forest or if I go to Maryland, but I know by staying here in West Virginia and, uh, and doing things the way that, that they turned out. And it wasn't planned that way. I won't take credit for planning it that way, but... I do say that that was a, the best decision that uh, that I could have made of that, at that time, that time of my life, and I'm so grateful that I did. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, looking at the fan base, obviously, you you talked about how passionate they were. I can hear it by the way you're talking talking about playing at WV, representing the state, and obviously, you've been back to a few games as well. Talk about the fan base. What makes West Virginia's fan base so different than other schools? I think their their loyalty. I mean, without a question, the loyalty and the fact that that um, that Hugs has come back has just multiplied by a thousand times. You know, he's a West Virginia kid. Uh, he spent time here, and 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 people appreciate the the, the ethics and the, the hard work that the, that the coaching staff puts in. You can see that by the attendance at the school with the basketball games every, every year in and year out. Um, the, um, the, the, the wins haven't been there in the, well, they haven't this last year. We suffered a lot of losses down year, but, uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, that, that I'm sure we'll get to in a minute. We're talking about the, the, the NCAA portal and we're talking about the, the NIL situation that goes on now in college sports. Um, but getting back to the fans, the fans were just they're, they're just true, true blooded. I mean, that's no, you know, a lot of people say, you know, we don't have a professional football team, we don't have a professional basketball team. West Virginia is our professional sports. Well, you know, we have Marshall, but you know, West Virginia is uh, what a lot of people. The only thing that a lot of people, fans, sports fans, have to to uh, hold dear to their heart, and they do. They're diehard, uh, diehard fans, and you can't do anything. But you, you may not like them all the time, but they're going to be there to support you no matter what you go through on the field or on the court. And having hugs back has just, uh, like I said, has multiplied that by a thousand because, and it's not going to change. Uh, for you know, because first of all, you know when they hired him. You know, everybody knew. I said, well, we got ourselves a Hall of Fame coach now. It took years for him to get in the Hall of Fame. I mean, does that mean a lack of respect for West Virginia? I don't know what that has. I mean, but it, it things like that just um, amaze me. The man should have been in the Hall of Fame years ago. And uh, and I'm hoping that the fact that he's from West Virginia is not what held him back. But uh, now he's in, and we're all extremely proud of him, and we're going to honor him. Here soon, in some way, I'm working on that right now. So I'm going to ask you two personal questions, and I appreciate you sharing that story that you did a few minutes ago. But let's start here. 
when you look back at your career, let's stick with your WVU career. But during your tenure with the Mountaineers, what would you do differently looking back at it now? My my career on the court, we're talking about just or? in general, just, just, in general? In, just in your time up here in Morgantown, what would you have done differently? Hmm. That's a good question. If anything, if anything, I don't. During my career, I don't think there's anything that I would have done differently other than not walking off that court at practice that day. Because I think that that, that thing, that particular incident, cost me a lot uh, going forward from that, that particular incident. It cost me a lot in draft. Uh, it cost me a lot mentally my preparedness, getting ready for the draft, it got me to the point where I um, I really didn't like basketball at the end of my senior year. I mean, it was, it was, it, it I just didn't, it just, it, just, it's got to, it got to my head so mentally that, you know, I didn't, uh, I just, uh, I went home for that, um, that summer. Big, uh, that's not a big, big mistake, but I went home because I wanted to, I wanted to get away from everything else. I wanted to get away from Morgantown. I wanted to get away from this uh, this uh, environment uh, as far as basketball concerned. And I went home, and that was the worst thing that I could have done. Uh, going to Welch at that time when I needed to be in Morgantown, uh, working on my game, working on my condition, and, and things like that. I went home, sulked, and just um, just didn't her to be a part of, uh, I just lost it. I mean, I, mentally I was so fatigued because it took so much out of me that year that uh, that's the only regret that uh, that I would have of being in Morgantown and playing basketball at this university. That, that it was my handling of that situation that, uh, that uh, caused me a lot of stress and a lot of uh, anxiety. If I could have done it again, I would have handled it differently. If I had known all the facts at the time, I would have handled it differently. But it just uh, took a lot out of me. And I'll end on this note. I should have asked you this whenever you finished telling that story. But did you ever think about leaving? Did you ever think about – I know, obviously, the, the, the phrase transfer portal was not around or even relevant, for that matter, whenever you played. But – did the thought of leaving WVU after that incident occur, or did it cross your mind? After that incident, it was, it was my senior year, so there wasn't anywhere for me to go. But I did consider leaving. Uh, it, it crossed my mind uh, after my sophomore year um, because things just weren't going well, and it, you could see more of the same things happening. And I, I, I reached out to uh, Coach Joe Redden, who was a good, uh, good friend of, of mine, my high school coach that we had a relationship where, uh, you know, we would talk on a regular basis and I would go down in front of my state and watch games and, you know, eat a dinner at his house. And, and, and I, I reached out to him and um, shared with him what was, what was going on, what was transpiring here and transpiring here. And he told me, he said, uh, you know, you just need to, you need to stick it out. And, uh, we went to a, a workout together, and he, he, you know, I told him some of the weaknesses that uh, that um, were pointed out to me by <laughs> the coaches, and uh, you know, he gave me some things to work on, and I did, and I, I lost probably 20 pounds, 20, 25 pounds that summer, and I came back from my junior year, and it was just, you know, I was ready, I was ready to play, because I worked hard and uh, played a lot of racquetball, a lot of racquetball. And if anybody needs to know what Rackman racquetball is, a tough game. Are you talking about trying to get in shape? That's, you know, start playing and getting better at playing racquetball. And it'll do all the cardio, all the muscles. Uh, it'll do it for you. And I got stronger. And I lost about 20 pounds. Came back ready to play. And uh, our junior year, we had, a, we, had a, we had a good year. But still, we had a losing streak of about six or seven games in a row. And. It kind of a lot of the other things that I've talked about came came into play, and uh, 
I lost uh, lost grip on that season, but we started out great. I mean, had a chance to go to the NIT, and uh, they uh, just decided that they didn't uh, didn't want us to go. <laughs> that was about the slap in the face. But whatever reason, I don't, I don't know. It's it's just a lot of things that you know people don't know that they go on in in the, in the athletic department that uh, causes a lot of. Uh, Kids and and uh, kids grief, and uh, I, I admire any 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 college athlete because I know some of the things that they go through, and it's not not all easy, you know, not easy. It's all it's a lot of trying for a young man that's uh, nineteen twenty years old and trying to to fulfill all his dreams and and obligations and that uh, people don't don't really take in consideration or see. Well, Maurice, thank you so much for your time. It was an honor to speak with you and just great catching up with you and learning about what your basketball journey looked like and how it all shaped out. So thank you for sharing everything with me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Absolutely. That will conclude episode 106 of Hoops Across the Mountain State with our terrific guest, Hall of Famer, Maurice Mo Robinson. And as always, you can follow me on Twitter at Taylor underscore Kennedy 7 for the latest about this podcast. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube as well. And I will catch you all next time, next week, this time next week, or however you're listening, on episode 107 of Hoops Across the Mountain State. Thank you all for listening, and stay safe. Also, one other note, special thanks to Mark Spruill as well for helping me with the video today. I'm not doing this via Zoom, so I needed to call in the big guns. And Mark Spruill, thank you so much for your help. Thank you guys for listening.